Okay. Like you said, hi, my name is Kelsey Chiquillo, and it's really good to see some familiar faces, and it's also good to see a lot of women in the crowd. Um, okay, so I'm basically just going to be telling you about the story of the invasive seagrass, Halophila stipulaceae, and where it came from. So I know I'm preaching to the choir right now, but seagrass beds are really important. They're key primary producers. They act as great nursery habitats. Um, they provide a lot of ecosystem services, like storing carbon and recycling nutrients and <laughs> all great things. But we also know that global, globally, seagrass beds are declining and are threatened. And so here I'm showing you just a graph from Waycott et al. 2009. She actually just left. I just saw her leave, which is unfortunate. Um, looking at the net change in area over time. And so basically, we're losing seagrass beds. And I learned from the last conference that we lose about one hectare um, every, every hour. But another growing concern is that in certain marine ecosystems, we have seagrass invasions. Um, and so just taking a step back, why should we care about invasive species? Well, we know that some invasive species or introduced species that have expanded in range um, can alter trophic structure. So like, for example, we have this um, Caribbean lionfish and it's been cut open to show what's inside the gut and there's a bunch of uh, juvenile Caribbean reef fishes. We also know that some invasive species can disrupt, um, can I have some water? Can disrupt environmental resources. So for example, this invasive ice plant in California secretes salt into its surrounding environment, not allowing for other species to grow. Um, but at least in the United States, invasive species are really costly. We spend about $120 billion a year just on the cost of management and the cost of damages and losses, which figuring out where it came from is one important step is to trying to mitigate. So coming back to the study species, early studies suggest that Halophila stipulaceae is displacing native seagrasses in the Caribbean. And so a study done in Dominica by Steiner and Willette et al. found that in 2008, the native occupied 85% of the area, while the invasive not really shown only occupied 6%. But in 2013, just in five years, the native only occupied about 13%, which is in this um, light green. And the invasive occupied about 86%, inhabiting areas that were not recently um, inhabited. And since its discovery, its range has expanded plus 700 kilometers. And so the question is, what is the source population to this Caribbean strain? Um, where did it come from? And so we know that Halophila stipulaceae is native to the Red Sea Indian Ocean, and it was introduced to the Mediterranean in 1894 during the opening of the Swiss Canal in 1867. Um, but we also know that it was found in Granada in 2002. And so one, one hypothesis as to how it could have gotten to the Caribbean is it could have been an independent introduction hypothesis where you have a single native uh, contributing to the Caribbean and another native contributing to the Mediterranean. And a hypothetical result would look like, so here I have just a hypothetical principal components analysis. You know, you have variation between populations and variation among populations. And what we would find is that the native would be, one native would be more closely related to the Caribbean and another native would be more closely related to the Mediterranean. Another hypothesis is that it could have been an admixture introduction where you have the combination of both the Mediterranean and the Red Sea contributing to the Caribbean strain. And one way that, it, one way that we would see it in the hypothetical result is it would be one panmictic population. So basically, random mating can occur. And then the last hypothesis is that it could have been a serial introduction hypothesis where you have a successful secondary invasions stem from the first invasion, which you know, came from the Red Sea. And this hypothetical result would look like the Caribbean would be more closely related to the Mediterranean, and the Mediterranean would be more closely related to the Red Sea, but the Red Sea wouldn't be closely related to the Caribbean. And so one way that we can trace source populations is using SNPs. So SNPs are single nucleotide polymorphisms that 
differ across members of the same species. So for example, we have a purple population, a blue population, and the orange population, and at one particular locus, we have a change in nucleotide. And so individuals in a population share similar genetic diversity, and this is useful because we can examine genetic variation among populations and track source population as well as gene flow. And so we can use programs like Structure um, to infer population boundaries by clustering genotypes without any prior assumptions. So this is great because I don't have to tell Structure where I sampled from. And so one way to interpret this sort of generic plot that I have is each column is an individual and then each horizontal segment is, are genotypes that have been partitioned into clustered populations. And so we have like a red, a blue, and uh, a yellow. And another way to look at this is when you've collected all the individuals from a single location, we can say that all the individuals have a cluster red, a cluster blue, and a cluster yellow. But I am going to tell you where I sampled from because I think that's important. So I sampled, I have 14 samples from the Virgin Islands, St. Thomas and St. John. I have 14 samples from Cyprus, Italy, Greece, and Tunisia. Eight samples from Allah, Israel, and then the Indian Ocean. And the way that we got collected SNPs was we used a um, 2B-RAD, which is a type 2 restriction associated DNA approach, and we recovered about 3,588 SNPs at a 5x coverage. And so some preliminary results from the four basins, so from the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, the Mediterranean, and the Caribbean, structure predicts only three clusters. And what's interesting is that there's really only one cluster in the Caribbean, only one cluster, well we only sample from one site, but one cluster from the Indian Ocean, and then in the Mediterranean we have this predominantly orange cluster with a little bit of this purple that's similar to the Indian Ocean, and this pink that's similar to the Red Sea. So we kind of can figure, so we kind of know from this result that it didn't come from the Indian Ocean. So when we just look at the Red Sea, the Mediterranean, and the Caribbean, it also partitions into three clusters, seeing this, sort of the same phenomena, where we have one cluster that's predominantly pink in the Caribbean, a little bit more admixture where you have pink, yellow, and blue, and then in the Red Sea we have blue, pink, and a little bit of, of the yellow. And then when we look at a principal components analysis, so we have um, variation between populations and then variation among populations, what, what I think is happening is the Caribbean is more closely related to the Mediterranean and the Mediterranean is more closely related to the Red Sea. And we can further expand on this by looking at population differentiation, so looking at FST values, zero meaning that they are the same and one meaning that they should have speciated yesterday. Um, we find that between the Caribbean and the Mediterranean, we have an FST of 0.118. And then in the Mediterranean, we have an FST of 0.124. And then what's not, what's interesting is that between the Caribbean and the Red Sea, we have an, a higher FST, which is 0.27. So this number is a little bit smaller than this number. And we can start to, um, Go back to our hypothesis. This kind of looks like the serial introduction hypothesis, where you have, um, well, I'll get to it. Um, so when we look at expected heterozygosity, so how much genetic diversity um, is within a population, we find that it decreases with each sort of invasion. So the Red Sea has the most genetic diversity, the Mediterranean has a little bit less, and the Caribbean even less, which makes sense because you took a subsample from a population and you moved it somewhere else and then it proliferated. And so what we can conclude, or that it didn't come from the Red Sea, but, but that it may have came from the Mediterranean where you have a successful secondary invasion stem from the first invasion which came from the Red Sea. And so I still have more work to do. That's not the end of my work. I want to increase my sample size. I actually want to calculate immigration rate. So is there a strong direction that it goes in? Um, maybe and estimate the number of introductions that occur. Because if we look at the genetic diversity, they're not clones. They have 
some genetic variation that occurs. And I also want to test for a bottleneck and create some coalescent trees. And with that, I would really like to thank some funding agencies, um, UCLA for bringing me here, uh, other funding agencies like NSF, my collaborators and authors like Gideon and um, Gabrielle, who's not here, and um, people who have helped me collect all over the world because it's a, it's a global study. <laughs> So with that, I would like to say thank you and take any questions. Thank you, Kelsey. That was great talk. Thanks. Okay, I'm sure there are questions. Very interesting, thank you. Um, and very interesting uh, sense of what's the means of dispersal in the um, so they do, they have found uh, male flowers in the Caribbean, in Venezuela, and when I was there last year, I found, um, yeah, it's still working. I also found um, some fruits and some flowers. So I think it's both sexual and clonal reproduction that's occurring, which I was under the impression that um, sexual reproduction is a sign of stress, but I was talking to somebody that it actually means that it's a healthy and occurring thing that's happening. So, okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, um, my question is, you, you did look at one population in the Indian Ocean, which is actually quite far from the Red Sea population. What about Somalia and uh, very high factors? Where else is it found? Can you find other populations? Where actually it finds where actually it's Um. I, I do need to still figure that out, like which population it was closest to, but I think it's, I don't know. I, I'll need to go through my data set, but yeah, I'll, I'll figure that out. Yeah. So what, what is the mechanism for dispersing to the Caribbean? Is it boats? Yachties. <laughs> I mean, but there could be like storms or that come through, and I'm, I'm, I don't really kn know enough about um, the oceanography of like what's happening in the Atlantic, but I think it's, it could be yachties. I mean, I know the Ruiz and Valentin in 2002, they sort of pr like hypothesized that it came from the Mediterranean, and we just needed to do a genetic study to <laughs> confirm that. Um, yes. That makes sense. And uh, I, got, I just got samples from Mozambique, so that'll be really interesting to see which the genetic diversity between the Mozambique and the yes, Caribbean. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so, did you find any difference, uh, population difference, genetic population difference in the Caribbean itself? Yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay we'll